Welcome, listeners, to the Inner Sanctum. Today's tale involves a criminal and a crack mine engineer blackmailed into cooperation, an unlikely collaboration in the search for the devil's fortune. 500 miles inside Mexico looking for a treasure that's said to reside in the clutches of the devil itself. Today I bring you an old time radio episode which has been suggested to me multiple times before. An episode from the Inner Sanctum, released on the 31st of the 1st, 1949. Oh yes, fresh off the press. <laughs> As usual, I fixed it, tweaked it, because this one in particular is exceptionally old and required a bit of love. But now at a stage where it's not blasting your ears out and clearer to listen to. Albeit this one is unfortunately in not such great condition, I did my best to remaster it. Now folks, believe it or not, I've managed somehow to get sick once again. There's a new strain passing by and traveling on the train every day and in a huge office of sick people basically means I'm gonna get a sick. So let me rest my voice for tonight without a sign off and I'll get some rest. Luckily right now it's only a sore throat and a minor inconvenience. So I should be on the mend ASAP. Have an awesome night my lovely listeners and a hoo-ha for my El Grey Enforcers, and I'll see you this Friday, hopefully as right as rain. Oh, if your dodgy criminal pal asks you to take a walk into a cave at night, don't go. Just some words of advice, mates. <laughs> Enjoy. Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, The Devil's Fortune, was written by John Robert and stars Carl Swenson in the role of Tracy, with Charles Irving as McNamara. And now for tonight's chaos. In the deep hinterland of Mexico, on the ground level over a mine shaft, a ceremony is being performed by a frightened group of men. A ceremony of fear. The drums beat, and a roaring fire licks up the night sky. Underground in a mine called El Fortuna Diablo, the Devil's Fortune, floodwaters rise slowly to choke off all life in the shaft. Clinging to the elevation of a ledge, trapped and at bay, with the waters lapping at his ankles, is a young man. His expression is desperate, as he fires a gun into the subterranean shadows at an unseen target. Give me a break, man! I've got a right to live! Bullets, Tracy. You better come out of your hands up or drown. I'm waiting just around the air. Yell your gun cocked, ready to shoot me down. Don't wait. <laughs> Take all the time you need making up your mind, Tracy. Choose the way you want to die. <laughs> Choose the way I want to die. <laughs> Mac will get me even if it cost him his own life. Mac happened to be in a furnished room across the border in El Paso. I came out of a stupor one morning, opened my eyes blarely, and there was Big Mac sitting on a chair. Hey, who are you, mister? Never mind, kid. <laughs> right now, you're more interested in the third man in the room. Third man? Over there, propped in the corner. With a knife stuck in his chest. Right. Recognize him? Yes, yeah, sure. Coombs. We were making the rounds together last night. Who killed him? You did. Huh? Check the knife. See if it's yours. I'll give you the details, kid. At about 2 a.m., you got into a quarrel with Coombs outside the Hotel Navajo. I happened to be around, taking it all in. You're a mining engineer, but you haven't worked in a year. You were stewing over your hard luck. You took it out on Coombs. 
It's hard to believe to take the corpse's pulse and then believe it. You blacked out and I hustled you both up here. Why? To give you a choice. Either I call the cops or the three of us go for a ride. We'll dump Coombe somewhere and then the two of us push on into the interior of Mexico. Is it a deal? Why are you helping me? What's in it for you, Mr. Uh, McNamara? You're a crack mine engineer. I need a crack mine engineer that I can trust. Your knife in Coombs means I can trust you anytime, anywhere. We dumped Coombs, and two days later, we were 500 miles inside Mexico. Mac? Huh? I've been thinking. That story that you palmed off on me about Coombs, you stuck that knife in him. <laughs> well, maybe. But you'll never be able to prove it now. Mac, you're crazy. And you're soft. Soft and sentimental. The world's an ant hill. Knifing Coombs was like stepping on an ant. Get tough, Tracy. Think big. How big? This big. I've got a map here. Yeah. Read off the name. El Fortuno Diablo. An abandoned gold mine just outside a native village called Alicante. All boxed in and boarded up. Hasn't been worked in 20 years. A fortune's been laying around begging for takers. Well, why hasn't anybody worked the mine? Fright. They're all petrified with fright. From the owner, a chump named Parento, right on down the line to everybody in town. There's a legend about the mine that scared them. <laughs> the devil is supposed to make his headquarters there. <laughs> the map is spotted with blood. Whose blood is that, man? A chump who had the map previous to me. Called himself Klondike. He lay there drooling over the map, whispering to himself about El Fortuno Diablo. Week in and week out, month after month, I listened to Klondike whispering to himself. Lay there. Lay where, Mac? I had to break his hand open to get the map out of his fingers. Where were you, Mac? <laughs> I'll tell you sometime, Tracy. Sometime when you get out of line, maybe you'll wish I hadn't told you. We reached Alicante, a bleak, backward village, where civilization came trickling in slowly by donkey cart over narrow mountain passes. From here on, kid, watch me operate. How are you going to get El Fortuno Diablo? Steal it. We steal the mine from a Senor Parento, that owner I told you about. It's all fixed. Tonight, Parento's being told the hoodoo is off the mine, and that he's a dope not to cut me in as a partner and start operating El Fortuno Diablo full blast. Who's telling all this to Parento? The one guy he listen to and believe. <laughs> What passes for the village wise man in these parts? A joker named Montesano. Montesano has this town organized, like Al Capone used to operate in Cicero. Everybody's scared not to listen to Montesano. But why will Montesano play ball with you? A gun in his ribs and 500 bucks in his palm. Just you watch how Montesano plays ball. I watch Montesano. That a home run for McNamara. We were in a room with Montesano, Parento, and a sharp-nosed fella named Salvador. Salvador acted as a sort of bodyguard, advisor, and local technical expert to Parento. You will work the mine, Parento. You and the Senor McNamara. Why, the legend del diablo. The curse is no more. When your father was killed, he put the 20-year curse on El Fortuno Diablo. Now the time is over. What well, the man, they will not work the mine. No Alicante can find nobody to work the mine. You will tell everybody in Alicante and in the mountains that Montesano say it is good to work the mine. 
Machinery trickled in by cart over the mountain passes. Fearful workers grumblingly responded to Mother Sauer's call. The shafts were rebuilt. The mine began in operation. At the end of the first week, McNamara played his trump card. He stole the mine. It was Sunday, the day of. Lorenzo and his man Salvador had just left the conference with Mac. Mac was laughing. The kind of laugh that meant he was grinding his heels into an anthill again. <laughs> Happy days, J.C. You've pushed your master plan another foot forward, huh? Oh, my old Tracy. Yeah, take a gander at this. It's a contract for purchase. For a dollar and other valuable considerations, Parento signs the whole mine over to Mr. McNamara. Parento signed this? Yeah, he did. But he thought he was signing a requisition for supplies from Tampico. <laughs> I pulled the old document switch on him. Mac, that's an outright steal. Parento will call you a liar and a thief. You'll never get that chance, Tracy. Mac, what are you up to with Parento? Parento and his stooge, Salvador, have just gone into the mine for an administrative look around. At my suggestion. And Tracy, I've got a hunch they're going to meet up with that uh, El Diablo. Matt, what have you done? Those other valuable considerations I gave Parento. There were a couple of lunch boxes, packed nice and appetizing with chicken sandwiches and hot drinks. In just one minute... I'm going to pull the steam whistle cord so that Parento and Salvador get the idea that it's noontime and they're hungry. Mm -hmm. Minutes up. Mac, what's the connection? What have lunchboxes got? Mac! Now you're smartening up, kid. The box is open on a wire like a booby trap. Reach for a sandwich and smoke gets in your eye. Mac! I'm not going to let you blow up. Please, chump. This is a gun in your ribs. Hey. You're itching to throw in with Parento and Salvador. Matt! <laughs> Parento and Salvador got hungry. Now we're really in the mining business, Tracy. Big. <laughs> The bodies came out of El Fortuno Diablo. Mac and I were out walking. The idea was that some of the explosion happened mysteriously while we were away. That night at the hospital, I talked to the local doc. Uh, poor Parento. We didn't even find enough of him to make a decent burial. Oh. So, blown to bits. And Salvador? Well, with Salvador, it was a miracle, Senor Tracy. Salvador lives but not his face. Now, when the bandages come off one day, it will not be the face of the Salvador we knew. Just like his mind, poor Salvador left his face behind him in El Fortuno Diablo. Parento blown to bits and Salvador with his head swathed in bandages. McNamara's master plan was going great. Now the mine worked full blast, round the clock, day and night. Montesano was on hand when needed, telling everybody the hex was off, keeping the men in line for Mac. The men were working overtime, but so was the accident emergency bell connecting the shaft to the shack we supervised from. The bell meant an injury, or worse. Tracy, if it's another casualty, I'll fry somebody in oil. We're running a mining operation at a hospital. It wasn't a hospital case this time. It was a case for the coroner. In the mine shaft, face upward, with his eyes fixed and unwinking, lay a miner, Miguelito. Well, I was sorry, senor, it's Miguelito. He let out a cry and dropped to the ground. I leave with paws of onions and I never forget Miguelito's cry. What killed him, Tracy? Well, nothing apparent, Mac. No wound, nothing. Shock, I'd say, from the look on his face. It was El Diablo. El Diablo coming for Miguelito. His face is black and standing from the side of his head. I see horns. Not that line of talk, Manuelo. You're scaring a man. The scared man don't mind gold. Your McNamara is a goof. 
the fighting devil who come before me, believe me. See, who get to the ground. Diablo let his footprints. <clears throat> we look. And there, clearly defined in the soft dirt, was a print. A hoof print. <laughs> Mac, it's a hoof. It's a cloven hoof. Tracy, so help me if you blow your top in front of the men. Miguelito had a heart attack, friend. He was just a kid, not up to being a miner. Now everybody back to work. And the men went back to mining for gold. And the emergency bell kept ringing. Tracy. Yes? Go fetch that Alicante wise man. Tell Montesano the men need another spiel about how the devil has called it quits and the hoodoo's off the mind. Has the devil called quits, Mac? Tracy, you blow your top and I'll blow your head off. I'm here to mine gold. If I have to kill every mother's son of you and work to mine myself. How do you explain the four murdered men? The bad hearts, the 24-hour shift. Maybe the men got to brawling among themselves down there. It's easier to blame a killing on the devil than face a murder rap. Now what? That's the fire bell. Fire, man. Another omen of disaster. Your gold mine is going up in smoke. Mine is a raging inferno. Mac ran around like a wild man, barking orders, working with superhuman energy. Oh, get that equipment, boys! Beat the fireman and I'll double everybody's pay! Hey, I saw a hundred men! Well, let the fire get out of control and lose the mine, and I'll sing every living one of you a farewell lullaby with it. Mac was threatening them with a sample submachine gun spray. He meant mass murder, and the men knew it. Now yeah, you're slowing up there. Uh, maybe a little music will give you more inspiration. It was an impossible task, but the men got the fire out. Tracy. Yes? About those hoof prints around the mine. The uh, cloven hook. I've been giving it a lot of thought. I thought those things didn't bother you. Not like they bother you, chump. They bother me another way. To me, it's a gimmick. And I get nervous if I can't figure out how a gimmick operates. A gimmick? I don't get you. We'll take a walk tonight, the two of us. And I'll show you what I figured out. <laughs> I've been playing timekeeper to the devil for a week now. Clocking them in and clocking them out. We took that walk with the wind at our back. We hauled up outside a deserted mud house located halfway between El Fortuna Diablo and the town. According to my timepiece, the devil is two minutes late. Matt, you're not making sense. <laughs> now, have yourself a look at the devil, Tracy. <laughs> The devil was walking stealthily toward the door of the mud house. It looked just like Manuelo had described him. Black from head to foot, horns rising from his skull, and feet formed in the hooves. We watched him when he came after me. I ran in panic into the mine. Here, in the trap. The waters are rising. Max around an L somewhere in the tunnel, waiting in ambush. And I have got a choice. Drown and meet Mac Bullet's head on. Tracy, your time's running out. Mac, I've got a right to live. Just laugh to Manuelo, and he spread the word. I told you I came here to my gold. You laugh to Manuelo. There isn't any gold. What a flesh trap spray at Meadowbrook. It's time for Clown Dyke to get that map. I shot up a Kansas bank to get the money to buy mining equipment. All right, so I got mine gold. You hear, Tracy? Mine gold! <coughs> Matt! What happened, Matt? Me, Tracy? You got me. Darn liar, I didn't even fire. The trick. It's a trick and you're me out. Matt shot into the air to confuse me. He's there behind an L where I can't see him in ambush. Matt! 
It's the devils. Like Manuela described him, black from head to floor with horns rising from his skull. How many devils are there around here, First Montesano? Not you. Montesano is a faker. He sees trivial, he do many things. Kill many men. I have come to know, senor, that there is no diablo. No devil? You're not standing there, huh? <laughs> well, I am real, senor. Behind this face, I am Parento. Parento? They couldn't even find enough of you for a decent burial. It was Salvador they could not find. In the hospital, the doctor agreed that Parento will drive the devil from El Portuno Diablo. And the police agree Parento will be their deputy. You killed Montesano and McNamara? Si, senor. <laughs> what is so funny, senor? McNamara. I was thinking of Mac Master Plan. <laughs> He never figured that booby crap he planted your lunchbox would blow up in his face. <laughs> Good thing Tracy came out of it all okay. What do you bet when he comes out of shock, he puts his diploma in the heart? The way Max framed him, I'd say Tracy was more engineer. An engineer. <laughs> Your audio drama of choice today is the 1940 story of the inner sanctum, the deadly dummy. And folks, I have not quite recovered. <laughs> <laughs> as you can hear, but I'm so, so close. So I promise next week you'll have me 100%. And as usual, I've remastered, de-clicked, and tweaked the audio so your ears are left in one piece. So I hope you enjoy today's audio drama all the way back from 1949. So turn the lights off, the sound up, and get ready for a classic audio drama. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in, come in. Tonight we're inaugurating a quiz. It's a cutthroat session called Take It or drop dead. To qualify, just tear off the top of your neighborhood mortician and send it to us by hair mail. <laughs> now, listen to this. Here's our terror tune. <sighs> if you could guess the correct title of our morbid berserker in one scream or less, here are the prizes you'll win. A brand new 1949 stainless steel guillotine. Just the thing for whittling down your wife's overhead. And a handsome hand tool Florentine dagger. A knife without a cut. And the take it or drop dead grand prize. A free, all expense, murder trial in a court of your own choosing. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, The Deadly Dummy, was written by Ed Adamson and Robert Sloan, and stars Mason Adams in the role of Steve with Elspeth Eric as Claire. Well, let's get to tonight's shivering shindy. Hmm? Oh, by the way, let me warn you, all references to ghosts, living or dead, is anything but coincidental. Ready? All right. This is what happened to a guy named Steve Kirk. Why do you keep asking me the questions? Why don't you ask Marlowe? 
asked him, Inspector. He'll tell you everything. I told you before, Pearson, Marlowe wasn't here. He is. He's in this room, sitting right there in that chair. That's just a ventriloquist dummy in the chair. You told me yourself, Marlowe is dead. I don't understand. That dummy is Marlowe. I can prove it to you. That dummy is alive, real. All right, all right. So he's alive. You think I'm crazy? Go ahead, Pearson. Let's hear the story, all of it, from the beginning. It began when I went to work as Marlowe's assistant. He was billed as the great Marlowe. The great Marlowe. His audience has always thought he was a wonder. But they didn't know him like I did. You couldn't please him no matter how hard you tried. There wasn't a meaner man alive than Fred Marlowe. I would have quit him right at the start if it hadn't been for Claire. I only stayed because of her. Claire, she was warm and wonderful. And she was Marlowe's wife. Ah, oh, gee. Claire, Claire, you gotta come away with me. Wouldn't do any good, Steve. He'd follow us wherever we went. You know him, he'd make our lives miserable. But we can't go on this way. How much of this can we stand? We don't have to go on this way. What do you mean? You really love me. Claire, we couldn't do a thing like that. You hate him as much as I do. But doing a thing like that. It isn't hard when you really hate when you really love... Somebody will find out. They always find Not out. Not the way I've planned it. Brown glass. You'll drink it. But how? You'll know. No, you'll never suspect. It will be during his act. What? That part keeps the water while the dummy whistles. You handle his props. All you have to do is put the powdered glass into the water pitcher before he goes on. He'll pour the drink himself. Yes. After he goes off, you can wash out the pitcher and the glass. There'll be no evidence. You do it, Steve? When? Giving his last performance the Lido on Tuesday. Tuesday. It'll be Marlowe's last performance anywhere. I'm on next. Everything's set, Steve? Yes, Mr. Marlowe, everything is set. You made sure of the water in the picture last night. You almost forgot about that. In there now. I made doubly sure this time. All right, Edie, let's go. Ready, Marlowe. Well? Yes, Fred? My last performance here. Aren't you coming out to watch? I'll be along in a moment. I wouldn't want you to miss it. We're going to be really great tonight. Aren't we, Edie? <laughs> yeah, you said it, Marlowe. Tonight, we're going to knock them dead. <laughs> Claire and I stood in the wings while Marlowe went to his act. It seemed like ages, like yeah, he'd never get to the part we waited for. That's what I want to say to you. And then finally... He ain't talking about drinking. I'm a little thirsty myself. That was the cue. Now he was coming to it. So you won't join me? No, oh, I never touch the stuff. <laughs> you go right ahead, Marlowe. scream shook in my throat. Suddenly, I didn't want it to die. Hating him, it wasn't enough reason for killing him. I wanted to stop him. The scream in my throat begged for relief. And then I felt Claire's hand grip mine. I turned to her. Her smile smothered the cry within me. Her hand tightened and pulled, and we walked away from the stage. Pearson! The doctor! Sent your wife for one, Marlowe. The pain is... It feels like there's a fire inside me. It won't bother you for long. Fire burning, cutting your feet. There's a dying. Yes, Marlowe. You're dying. Pearson, help me. Nothing can help you now. I won't die. The doctor will save me. He won't let me. There won't be any doctor. What? Claire didn't go for one. Claire, she wants me to die. She hates me. You and Claire, you... You did this to me. When you drank that water back at the Lido tonight, there was ground glass. <clears throat> ground glass so finely powdered you couldn't see or feel it. PG. A dummy can't help you, Marlowe. PG, PG, I'm dying. Help me. <laughs> well, Marlowe, you're just the ham at heart. What? A real ham. It, don't you think so, Steve? <sighs> what is this? Oh, that deathbed scene of Marlowe's. Right off the top. I thought it was quite good, you think? Uh, strictly amateur night. Strictly. Marlowe. Marlowe, you... 
You're all right. You see, P.T., I had Pearson believe you. But it can't be. You drank that water. I saw you. Yes, I drank that water. But you're all right. It, 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 it's not possible. Milo, you're killing our friend Steve with suspense. <laughs> Come on, give him a break. Of course. Here you are, Pearson. Here's your ground glass. Marlowe had known we were up to something. Somehow he had switched the container of ground glass I had bought. He let me leave his hotel room without another word. I didn't know what to do, what to expect. I waited. Three days went by. Then he sent for me. Sit down, Pearson. I'll be with you in a minute. Marlowe was busy packing a trunk. I sat there waiting. The dummy, Peter, was propped up on the table, his perpetual grin mocking my fear. Our friend looks kind of uncomfortable, Marlowe. Really, Peter? Why did you send for me, Marlowe? I suppose you're curious as to what I'm going to do about you. All right. What are you going to do? Absolutely nothing. I just wanted to tell you about Claire, Steve. She's poisoned. Peter never did like Claire. Marlowe's a sucker for that dame. Yeah, I guess she never told you that she tried to have Marlowe knocked off before. There was another guy who had the job before you. Claire fed him the same lie. She's lying, Marlowe. Why don't you ask her? She'll be back soon. Claire wants Marlowe's money, but not Marlowe. <laughs> she was just using you. Shut up. She'd give you the go-by so fast. Shut up, I said. You're out of her class. She wouldn't want you in a million. Oh, this will shut you up. I'll break you into a million pieces. <laughs> You're a fool, Pierce. You forget there are other pieces. After all, they're only me. Remember? So you see, the only sure way to shut them up is to stop me. Hmm? <laughs> Marlow taunted me with a sickening laugh. I couldn't stand it. I had to stop her some way. I felt along the table behind me. My hand came across the heavy glass ashtray. I gripped it tightly, then brought it up from behind. Slumped to the floor. The grin was still on his face. I bent down over him. He was breathing. I hit him again. Marlow was dead. You shouldn't have done that, Steve. It was the dummy talking. I heard him. He lay on the floor. I had crushed him into a hundred pieces. But they were his words, his voice. You can't get away with murder. You'll see, Steve. <laughs> There, I tell you, that dummy did talk. Pete, it couldn't be. But I heard him. He talked to me, Claire. He talked Pete, to me. Pete, I hold it myself. It jumped in your mind, that's all. You shouldn't have done it. If you'd only waited, we would have found a safe way. Someone's at the door. We can't open it. You've got to. Body on the floor now. Sit Here, in. help me. What are you going to do? Put him in the trunk. Close the top and lock it. You stay here, I'll go to the door. Arnold's room? Yes. I come for the trunk, lady. Oh, there must be some mistake. Well, that's a trunk, ain't it? That's what I come for. Mrs. Marlowe said you're mistaken. Look, mister, I got an order here. See? One trunk, number 3468. That's the number on the tag of this here trunk. Now, listen. The order says this trunk goes to stateroom 3D on the Tregania. That's what it says. Again, your sales tonight. How do I take this here trunk or don't I? Yes, yes. I, I'm sorry. That was our mistake. Well, Claire. Please, take the trunk. Hey, lady. Hey. What do you have got in this here trunk anyway? A dead body. What? what do you mean by that? Forget it, mister. It's just a gag. How about one of you two hold the door? Yes, I'll do it for you. Thanks, there, what's wrong with you? Why did you let him take it? Don't you see, Steve? See what? This is the way out for us. His body won't be found here and we're safe. Now he's gone forever. Nobody will ever know. No one? What about me? Claire. Tell her about me, Steve. 
Mr. Sam, now you can believe me. Hey, what's wrong? Dummy, you heard him. Just your nerve, no, darling. No, he spoke. That's right, Steve. You tell her. There he is again. Steve, where are you going? i got to find that dummy someplace in this room. Hello, Steve. Looking for me? <laughs> the dummy was propped up against the closet wall. He looked at me with the same evil grin as the one I had crushed to pieces. Please, please stop staring that way. I'll burn him, every rotten fiber of him. I'll burn him to an ash. And I'll never talk again. Please believe me, he didn't talk. It's just for imagination. I'm not crazy. I heard him. So did you, only you're too afraid to admit it. He couldn't talk without Marlo. Marlo would have to be alive for that dummy to speak. What? What'd you say? Marlo would have to be alive. You know that. Yes, yes, that's right. What's the matter with me? Yes, he would have to be alive. He was just your... Then Marlo isn't dead. Oh, now, Steve, please. He wasn't dead when you put him into the trunk. He just wanted us to think Steve. he was. I didn't kill him. He wasn't dead. That's why the dummy talked. Marlo can do tricks like that. Come on, Claire. We've got to hurry. No, wait, wait. We've got to get there fast. Where, Steve? What are you talking about? Marlo's stateroom on the boat. He'll be there in the trunk. I've got to make sure he's dead. <laughs> on this deck, Claire. 3D, there it is. There's the trunk in the corner over there. Give me the key. Oh, see, we shouldn't have come here. I said, give me the key. No, Steve, please don't open it. He is dead in there. I know you. Yeah. me. Oh. I grabbed the purse and took out the key. I unlocked the trunk. And I pulled up the lid. Marlo was in there, motionless. When I touched him, he was cold. Marlo was dead, all right. But there was something else in the trunk with him. At his feet. And the same grin was on his wooden face. Hello, Steve. I knew you'd come. I was waiting for you. Here, Steve, drink this. Oh, I don't know what happened to me. Everything went black. You fainted. You were right. Marlo is dead. But that dummy, I heard him speak. No, Steve, it's just as I told you. You only heard it in your mind. He didn't really talk. Oh, Claire, Claire. Well, those things happen, and now it's over, and you'll never hear it again. Can you get out? Yeah, I'm all right now. We've got to get off this boat before somebody sees us. I ruined everything. No, we're still safe. Nobody knows we came here. You go first. That'll be the best way. I'll follow in a moment. Yes, I'll meet you on the pier. All right. How do you do, man? Oh. oh, sorry to give you such a joke. My name is Igginsman. I'm your steward. Just stop by so we'd know each other. Uh-huh. Time was against us. We were too late in getting out of that stable. That steward would remember Claire. Steve, what are we going to do? There was only one chance. With Marlowe's body in that trunk, there was only one thing we could do. I had Claire ring for the steward. Yes, ma'am? Uh, Mr. Marlowe and I have decided to cancel our trip. But, Would but... you please have the porter stump for our trunk and take it to the pier? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Marlowe, but that won't be possible. What? What? Well, in the excitement, ma'am, you probably didn't notice. Notice? What are you talking about? Our departure. We sailed 20 minutes ago. <laughs> walked into a trap of our own making. A trap that was snapped closed on us by a dead man. Marlowe was a cold corpse in that trunk, but we were held by his invisible grip. Steve, there's still a chance we can get out of this. You mean if his body isn't found in that trunk? We'll arrange it so his body will never be found. We'll do it tonight when the deck outside is dark and deserted. You'll see, Steve. We'll be really rid of Marlowe this time. You'll see. got our first break. Early in the evening, a storm came up and grew worse with the passing hours. About 11 o'clock, I made a careful check of the promenade deck outside the stable. It was completely deserted. We supported Marlowe's body between us and carried it toward the darkened space at the end of the deck. In the morning, I'll report my husband is missing. I'll ask a lot of questions. I'll have all the answers, the way we planned them. Tell him how he often gets up at night to go for a walk. And the dizzy spell. Yes. Now that it is dizzy spell, that's how it must have happened. Another terrible dizzy spell, and he fell overboard. 
Meantime, Steve, you'll have to hide. I found a place in one of the lights. We'll meet every night. Wait, I... wait. What is it? I thought I saw somebody down that way. I don't see anyone. It was probably just a shadow. Come on, let's get this over with. You can help me lift him to the rail. All right, now push. Yes, Claire. That's the end of Marlowe. Now we can live. Really live. Will you kiss me, Steve? Will I kiss you? Come here. Oh, Steve. Oh. I think you oh. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm looking for someone. I thought he might be with you. There was no one with us. No, we're alone. I see. I thought I saw three people walk over here. No. It's so dark, I must be mistaken. Yes, it is dark. The man I'm looking for is Mr. Marlowe. What? You happen to know him? Uh, My name is Marlowe. Then you're the gentleman I'm looking for. My name is Alf Kramer, Miss Marlowe. Kramer. Are you all right, Miss Marlowe? Yes, yes, I'm fine. Why? I just wanted to be sure. By the way, I received your letter. Letter? Don't you remember? Uh, uh, no, not exactly. Oh, I can understand. You're a busy man, Miss Marlowe. Well, just to refresh your memory, I'm in charge of entertainment here on the boat. I found out last week that you had booked passage. So I wrote to you asking you to consent to be one of the features in our theatrical tomorrow night. And I replied? You were very kind, Marlowe. You said yes. I just thought I'd thank you and say that we're all looking forward to your performance this tomorrow evening. He's got to keep trying. There isn't much time left. Won't work, Claire. It will, it will. You know Marlowe's act. You want to study him? You went on for him in Cleveland, remember? I know, but I can't do it now. I can't get it. It'll come to you, darling. Now just keep trying. Go on, Steve. Please try again. All right. Tell me, Petey, don't you and your girlfriend, Phoebe, ever have a difference of opinion? Sure, Marlo. But I wouldn't dare tell her about it. Oh, you see, Claire, it's no good. And you're doing fine. Don't tell me. I know it's rotten. Tell him I'm not going on. Steve, it means our lives. You've got to go through with it. Sure. You can do it, Steve. I'll see you through. Claire. What's wrong? What is it? The dummy just talked, and I didn't do it. He said, you can do it, Steve. I'll see you through. You heard him, didn't you? No. Don't let her kid you, Steve. Terry said something again. You didn't hear that either. Oh, now, Steve, don't. You've got to put yourself together. Dane can really play angles, can't she, friend? Yes, she really can. Well, who are you talking to? You know who I'm talking to. You know all about it. Go ahead, Steve. You tell her. You're her. making a dummy talk, Claire. It was you all the time. I don't know what you're saying. You're trying to drive me crazy. That's why you're doing it. Now I know what Marlowe said about you was true. You were just using it. No, Steve. You I... wanted Marlowe dead. You wanted his money. Just as he said you were playing me for a second. Steve, don't look at me that way. No, I... You for the first time, what you're really Don't you come near me. You are the same evil grin as that dummy. Because that's what you are, something inhuman. No, stay away. Something mean and vicious and bad. Steve. Steve. No. My hands grip the oh. fur and squeeze tighter and tighter. Stop. Nails digging deep into the soft flesh. The color slowly drained out of her face. There was a final gasp and then she stopped moving. She was like a rag doll in my hand. I stood there holding her lifeless body. Then after a while, I heard a knock on the door. Miss Marlowe! Miss Marlowe, it's Ralph Kramer! Mr. Kramer? What? What is it? It's Ralph Stockton. Go out and five minutes. All right, Kramer. I'll be there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we take extreme pleasure in presenting the great Marlowe. sat there with a dummy on my knee and looked out on him for the sea of faces. All the men had the same face. It was Marlowe. The women were Claire. I tried not to look at them. Come on, Steve. The dummy whispered to me. Come on. I told you I'd see you through. Let's go. <clears throat> Petey, I want you to meet the folks. Hiya, folks. <laughs> uh, uh, my name's the winning, Steve. Oh, it's Marlowe. Marlowe. Uh, who was that lady I saw you with last night? Uh, uh, last night? Uh, that was no lady. That was... Now, uh... you're not going to tell me it was your wife. 
least as I know, is the wife she was. Sort of a deadhead, isn't she, Steve? Oh, I told you not to call me Steve. You'll give it away. I warned you about that dame, remember? I told you she was playing you for a stutter. Stop talking about her. We've got to get back on the routine. Uh, the routine, yeah. That's what she gave you. Cut it out. Cut it out. Hey, with brown glass. If you huh? stop to help me, I'll choke you. Yeah, how do you like this guy, folks? He wants to choke me and cut his best part. Oh, I'm warning you, just one more wrong word. Please, this will kill you, folks. Uh, wait till you hear the story I'm going to tell you. No. And it's no joke. Oh. Uh, you think this is Marlowe here, huh? Don't listen to him. He's lying. You can't stop me now. It's too late, Steve. Don't listen to him, please. He doesn't know what he's saying. <laughs> he's going to tell you lies. He's going to tell you I'm a murderer, but don't believe him. <laughs> make him stop laughing. Get him out of here. Somebody make him stop, please. <laughs> That's it, Inspector. That's the whole story of what happened. It was all because of the dummy on that chair there. You give us a lawyer's name and we'll call him. I don't think the lawyer would do me much good now. That's up to you, Pearson. I'll think it over. Okay, Robert, let's take him downstairs. I don't suppose you'll need me any longer, Inspector. Uh, just one question, Kramer. Uh, what's that? Why did you hear the dummy say that night when Pearson tried to go through with Marlowe's act? Oh, the dummy didn't say a word. Pearson was up there on the stage talking to himself. Well, that closes tonight's cadaverous chapter. Poor Steve Pearson, he just couldn't help double-talking himself into a knot, the kind the hangman tie. Now he's in a grave condition. But it's his own fault, you know. His dummy done so, yeah. You know, the real reason he killed Claire is because he figured two dead heads are better than one. Well, anyway, all's well that ends dreary. Yes, as we say here in the inner sanctum, the end always justifies the scream. <laughs> so, folks, Marlowe's dummy really got into Steve's head. I mean, the dummy really, really got into his head. I sure. Practically killed himself. <laughs> That's right, Tale Teller. You tell them. Uh, did did you folks hear that? <laughs> Must be in my head. Best not uh, dwell on it. Mates, next week I'll be focusing back on my old gray supporter stories, as I think by then I'll be 100% and not coughing every two takes. And in between those stories, I think it's time for some awesome no sleeps. A big shout out to my six Earl Grey Patreon supporters, in no particular order. Matthew J. Bauer, Andrew Benezzi, Chad Warren, Lorraine Crisanto, Mace Joe, and Peter Raffaelli. Thank you so much for your support. Have an awesome weekend, stay brilliant, and I'll catch you down under, mates, next Monday. Cheers. <laughs>